Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things, but now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So earlier this month, I had a meeting in Boston with one of my bishops, and so I made the journey into the city, parked in the Boston Common Garage, which is where I usually park, and then I headed toward the Episcopal Diocesan offices at 138 Tremont Street. And as I walked across the common, I could see sitting on a park bench a young man with a sign in his hand that read, Hungry. And he had a basket next to him with some spare change in it. As I looked his way, he made eye contact with me and I could tell by his body language that he wanted me to stop. I'm ashamed to admit that in that moment I was filled with a combination of trepidation and annoyance. Much as I wanted to be compassionate, I had an important meeting to get to and I wasn't sure if I had enough time for a conversation. On the other hand, I felt the pinch of my collar around my neck, and I knew I had to do something. And so I started reviewing in my mind all the options for how I might respond, just as I have many, many times before. Some days I say hello, drop money into the poor soul's basket, and then continue on my way. Other days I stop. And rather than giving spare change, I'll offer to buy the person a sandwich from one of the street vendors, thinking to myself that food is, a be is better than money since it can't be used to fuel an alcohol or drug addiction. Still other days, I'll stop and try to explain where the nearest shelter or feeding program is located, believing that pointing to our city's social services might be a better strategy and furthering a dependency on handouts. But then, I'm ashamed to say, there are also those days when I'm too distracted with my own issues to bother to stop at all, or in too much of a hurry to make eye contact with the person. 
And there are even those occasions when I'm just plain sick and tired of having to face this depressing social reality every time I go into the city and secretly wish I could be freed of such unwanted interruptions. Now, I'm not proud to acknowledge these feelings, but these feelings are real. It's what makes us human. And I suspect many of you may struggle with this same mix of emotions in your own encounters with people on our streets. But on this particular day, something different happened. As the young man got up from the park bench, he did not ask me for money, but instead he gestured me to come near, saying, Pastor, will you please sit and pray with me? It was midday, and the common was filled with folks, each on his or her own mission, and I admit feeling slightly self-conscious at this invitation to pray in public with a young fellow whom I did not know. But I overcame that discomfort, as I knew I had to as a pastor, and I sat down next to him on the bench. As I did, he gently took my hands, and he said to me, my name is Michael, and I'm out of work. Would you please pray that I might find a meaning job. And I have a mother, Dolores, who has a heart condition, and I'm worried about her. Could you pray for her, too? And so there we sat in the midst of the Boston Common, Michael and me, praying together on a park bench. And that is when my eyes were opened to something that I should have seen long before. Suddenly, this homeless person, this social issue, this problem to be solved, or even worse, this nuisance to be avoided, was a man named Michael with a mother named Dolores, a man with a story, someone's son, someone with hopes and dreams as well as pains and disappointments. Someone who, but for the grace of God, easily could have been me. It was then that I realized that I had been asking the wrong question all along. The question is not whether I should or shouldn't give this young man spare change, or something to eat, or some helpful advice about the nearest social program. The question I should have been asking myself is, am I willing to see? and listen to, and be with Michael. Jesus' parable of the rich man and Lazarus is too often reduced to a simple morality tale about the dangers of greed, the vice of self-indulgence, and the sin of indifference to others. But this interpretation doesn't do full justice to the parable. Well, to be sure, there is a stinging critique here of the oppression of the, of the poor by the rich. There is a subtler and related message embedded in the parable as well, a message about the sacred reality of other persons and our fundamental interconnectedness. One of the most striking things about this parable is that it is the only one of Jesus' parables in which he names one of the characters, Lazarus. The prodigal son is never named, nor the good Samaritan, nor the shrewd manager, nor the woman who lost her coin, nor any of the others. But Lazarus is. He is not just some anonymous, faceless, impoverished man. Lazarus is given an identity and a story. Jesus knows him, suggesting that we should know him too. Moreover, the name Lazarus is the Greek form of Eliezer, which in Hebrew means God helps. And Eliezer, you may remember, is the name of Abraham's companion from Genesis 15. 
himself a model of faithful and hospitable service to Abraham and Sarah. Read this way, Jesus' parable invites us into a relationship with Lazarus by naming him, by describing his plight, and by recalling for us the cherished relationship Abraham enjoyed with his loyal friend of the same name. Indeed, the intimate nature of the relationship we are invited into is modeled for us at the end of the parable as we see Lazarus at Abraham's bosom after he is carried into heaven. The New Revised Standard Version of our Bible translates verse 22 to read that Lazarus died and was carried off by the angels to be with Abraham. And that's what I read. But the better translation of the Greek is that Lazarus was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. That is close to his heart. There is, in short, a great chasm in the parable between the loving and sacred relationship that Abraham and Lazarus share and the utter lack of relationship between the rich man and Lazarus. The text vividly portrays for us how the rich man, so absorbed in his own pleasure, keeps Lazarus out of sight, physically separated on the other side of a gate. The rich man seeks to protect himself from all the Lazaruses of the world, leaving them to be tended to by the dogs who lick their sores. It's not so much that the rich man does anything affirmatively mean to Lazarus, it's just that he refuses to notice him, keeping him at a distance, not recognizing him as a fellow human being, treating him instead like he's just another domestic animal or a part of the landscape. And notice this too. Even after the rich man is condemned to the fires of Hades for his callous self-absorption and pleads with Abraham for mercy, the rich man never calls out to Lazarus directly for forgiveness. Instead of speaking to Lazarus, the rich man pleads with Abraham to dispatch Lazarus as a messenger to save the rich man's brothers once again treating Lazarus not as a brother himself, but as a servant to be used for the rich man's own purposes. The rich man's sin is less his wealth than it is his indifference and intractable sense of privilege. He remains blind to the reality and sacred dignity of another human being both in this life and in the next life. For those of us who, like the rich man of today's parable, enjoy privilege and who live in neighborhoods largely immune from real poverty, hunger, and homelessness, this is a haunting story indeed. Certainly as I reflect back on my own experience with Michael earlier this month in Boston, I feel convicted by Jesus' words. As with so many of Jesus' parables, the point of this one is not so much to yield some handy moral truth as it is to disturb us, to provoke us to see the world differently so that we might begin the slow and often halting process of personal conversion and transformation. I hope and pray that today's parable prompts all of us, not least of all myself, to begin to see our neighbors a little differently, to see a Michael on the street corner rather than just another unnamed homeless person, and that by doing so, we will gradually be brought into a deeper and more generous sense of community with all of our brothers and sisters. As many of you may remember, one of my favorite quotes from St. Augustine is a simple one that goes like this. God gave us things to use and people to love. And
and sin is the confusion of the two. Maybe that's not a bad caption for today's gospel lesson. God gives us things to use and people to love. The rich man's terrible confusion and ultimate sin was in falling in love with his money and things rather than with his brother Lazarus. May God help us all from making this same mistake.